I'm Jane Perone and this is episode 285 of my venerable podcast, On The Ledge. Venerable because it's been here since 2017. In this week's show, I talked to Michael Holland about his book, A Jungle In Your Living Room, finding out how to get kids engaged with the subject of indoor gardening. Plus, I answer a question about mealybugs. <laughs> I don't know about you, but January felt like it was about a million years long. So I'm glad to be entering February and hoping that the extra light that's coming our way in the Northern Hemisphere will start to do good things for my houseplants, which are definitely not enjoying the lack of light. I've got a piece coming out in the Financial Times UK newspaper this Saturday all about helping your plants cope with this time of year. So do check that out. Uh, I don't know if it will be freely available or not or whether it'll be behind a paywall. But if I can link to that on my socials, I will. You can also dig back into the On The Ledge archive where I talk about this in episode 118 of the show and also 113 and 68. Yes, this is a topic I've covered a few times. I'll put links to those episodes in the show notes for you to check out as well. So if you're struggling with your plants at this time of year, then do go and listen back to the archive. Onwards and upwards, though. And this week, it's all about inspiring the next generation of growers. That's why I'm chatting to Michael Holland about his new book, A Jungle in Your Living Room. But let me tell you, if you don't have any children and don't have any interaction with children... I would still buy this book because it's absolutely lovely and you'll get loads out of it. It's beautifully designed and I think it's a delight. So without any further ado, let's get chatting to Michael. Hello, I'm Michael Holland. I'm a freelance nature educator and an author. And I've had a long career of working in botanical gardens, including Chelsea Physic Garden, and briefly at Kew Gardens, and um, I love plants. Well, that's a really good starting point, Michael, because everyone listening loves plants too, as do I. So I loved getting a copy of your book, A Jungle in Your Living Room. I've long thought that there needed to be a book for children about houseplants, and you've really, uh, to use an Americanism, hit a home run here, because I think this book is so stunning and what I love about it is that it really doesn't dumb down like I I could read this book uh, and at the level of house planting that I'm at and still be uh, engaged and fascinated Uh, but it's just so accessible so I love this book I'm really glad we're here to talk about it I guess I want to know your secret sauce though how did you go about coming up with a book that really spoke to children and engaged with them without it kind of getting cheesy and patronising, which is something we don't like in children's books? That's a good question. I, I wrote it with close, all the way through, very close kind of um, contact with my editor. And um, she she was terrific, basically. Um not only kind of spoon feeding me deadlines, which were the, the right kind of deadlines for me, rather than all all in one go, in small stages or chapters or sections. Um, but I think, I mean, in my head, although I knew I was writing a children's book, I, I know at the back of my mind that adults are going to read it, whether that's the parents or the grandparents or the aunties, uncles, and just or just adults who just like the look of the book as they should do because it is beautiful. Um, but um, I'm, am I answering your question? That's the question. <laughs> um, I mean, I've I've written it just the way I would like like people to hear the kind of the the ins and outs of of how to look after houseplants, how not to kill them, how to revive them from near dead, and other things. I guess one thing I could say is that maybe this is where your years as a nature educator come in, in that you are you have an understanding of what children are going to want to ask and how to approach this. I'm guessing that would be the case. Is, is that accurate? I mean, I guess that's it. You, I didn't want to blow my own trumpet. Please but, you do. Know, I've had, like, like you say, <laughs> you, 
I, I have, I, you know, nearly 30 years of teaching people from the age of two to 92, uh, all about the natural world. And I guess whether it, you're talking about photosynthesis or propagation or sort of plant pathogens or what, or ecology and the interrelations between things in the, in the world, um, sometimes it's saying the same story to different audiences and you, of course you've got to say it differently. So maybe that's, that's my gift. I mean, perhaps I don't, that sounds a bit grand, but you know, I've, I think I've got the hang of kind of, yeah, say, saying things in the right way. What I love about this book, as I've already said, is that it really doesn't shy away from a little bit of scientific Latin, some botanical terms. And I think oftentimes that might be a dilemma for people working on um, or working with children uh, in this topic area, but you chose to include those things. Why was that? Well, with my first book with this publisher, Flying Eye Books, um, which is called I Ate Sunshine for Breakfast, um, which came out in 2020, while writing that, I was making sure that there was botanical Latin throughout it. Um, When it came to the editing stage, they were a little unsure. They did say for a children's book, this is a bit much and a little bit technical. Um, And I guess it's because having worked in a botanical garden for 25 years, I basically had that drummed into me that actually... Yeah, you can say daisy or daffodil, or but actually there is only one Bellis perennis or Narcissus, but it, there is only one of those. And I guess also from the sort of accessible point of view, um, and potentially this um, for, for books, uh, if any of these books are translated into other languages, as as my first one has into like twenty five or maybe more languages so far, um, there is you know scientific names are n- not um, you know they're they're universal. And that's the whole point of them. But a common name could just be, there could be more than one plant with the same common name, but there's only one plant with the same scientific name. So that's the reason. And the, and I think the uh, the editors and the publishers basically eventually, they just thought, yeah, actually, that does make sense. So that was a ni- another long answer to a, to a short question. But, and also a glossary of terms and kind of making just, I think it's just important to, that that's quite a good discipline, the whole scientific name thing. Um, and and kind of quite a lot. There is a lot of technical jargon in there as well, but that's where the glossary comes into play at the back of the book. And I, in my experience, I find that it tends to be adults rather than children who are scared of scientific names. Children are kind of a, a, a blank slate onto which you can, if you tell children from the start that, well, this is the name and it's okay for you to say it however you can say it, you know, as long as you're getting the the overall you know, as long as you know what you're saying, um, whereas adults tend to be the ones who've perhaps been told in the past, oh, you know, you can't say this, you're not good at this kind of stuff. And therefore, they end up being very afraid of scientific names. I think generally, if you start children off with the idea of, yeah, this is your territory, you can do this, this is absolutely fine. And then there's no fear there for them. Um, that's my experience anyway. I, I Maybe I'm very biased because I was that weird child who was just loved all the scientific names. Um, and it kind of, I kind of felt at the time that it was almost like a sort of a, a magic spell or a superpower that I knew something that adults didn't know that I could kind of throw that out there. I don't know if that was just me, but... A secret language. And that's a powerful thing. But then from children's point of view, what about, you know, Tyrannosaurus rex, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus? They're all long names. They're all scientific names. But um, when it comes to plants, it seems to be a different matter. Why do you think that is? For some reason. I suppose it's easier to say daisy <laughs> than it is bellis. Because uh, I guess we don't need to in our daily lives. And and Ty- Tyrannosaurus rex doesn't have a comment, doesn't have but a nickname. I wonder whether there's something more to it than that. I think whenever you talk about conservation or about, you know, the science of biology, plants sit, somehow seem to be at the bottom, on the bottom rung and anim- animals are treated differently. I don't know if that's, you find that true. I think that's generally the, the, the gist of things. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to conservation bodies um, and yeah, I, I I I think that's the general general climate at, at at the moment and and for decades. Well, hopefully really. your book will do something to start changing that because it is so accessible. As was your previous book. Uh, just just briefly tell us what your previous book was about, just for anyone who hasn't seen it, because I think this is also worth knowing about. Yeah, um, I eat sunshine for breakfast is a compendium of plants around the world, but it starts off by basically just going back to school. 
um, with what is a plant, how does it work, how do they work rather, what, where do they all come from, the kind of plant family, so basic taxonomy, a little bit about the flowering life uh, cycle of a, of a flowering plant, um, how, you know, what is a flower for to make seeds, what is a seed, how does it germinate, kind of really back to basics. And then I delve right into the wonderful world of plants in our lives, um, hence the title. You know, we are part of a food chain, a food web. We eat sunshine for breakfast. Um, without the sun, we would be, there'd be no photosynthesis and with, or without plants, we wouldn't exist because we use so much stuff, whether it's our furniture, our oxygen, our clothes, our toothpaste, the musical instruments we like to listen to music on, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I got into the wonderful world of ethnobotany or cultural botany um, and symbolism and religious uses of plants and so forth. So that's, and then throughout both this one and um, that book are quite a lot of DIY activities for people to try whether that's a plant maze for a bean plant made out of a, a shoebox uh, or how to light a, a LED light with a potato or or just a start a bottle garden or something quite simple or grow, grow some pips from the kitchen, which which is a bit of a overlap with jungle in your living room as well. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I do think that growing growing pips thing is um, it's amazing. I mean, I had a grapefruit tree that I grew at Brownies that was in our kitchen for many years. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what happened to it. Uh, when I presume when my parents moved overseas, it had to be uh, composted. But it did. It was a. It was a beautiful thing that I'd grown from seeing at Brownies, and I remember that being quite a formative um, part of my plant education. So it's a. It's a. There are some fantastic projects in both books. If people are listening, have maybe children or grandchildren who just are not at all interested in plants, don't show any interest other than buying them your books. I mean, where can people start with this if they're worried that their children are disconnected with nature? How can we reconnect and, and relink them to what's going on in the natural world? I would say, as with your experience, you know, start start at home, start with what we have already, whether it is a grapefruit or a satsuma, a lemon, or a um, clementine pip. A citrus, citrus seeds grow really, really easily. Um, and without much help, and they might not, you might not end up with any fruit, but you'll have a lovely house plant for, for potentially decades. And um, yeah, start with what you have in the, in the house. It might be, it might be taking a, a cutting from a an existing plant. Um, so the wonderful idea of propagating stem cuttings from your pothos or your pelagoniums or whatever you might have in the house, or even sprigs of mint that you might have in the garden that you can just put in a jar and then see that magic, magic of well, not the magic, the science of the, or the wonder of the roots growing from it, what were leaf nodes. Um, but then, yeah, avocados and dates. There's so much stuff. And actually, as a, as a child, my parents bought for me for my eighth birthday a book which um, many of your listeners may know, and if they don't, they must look up, called The Pip Book by Keith Mossman. And um, it was published in the late 1970s. And it really got me really interested in exactly that, you know, just – I mean, my my window sills around the house and the airing cupboard at home where the boiler lived, with no, no, none of those were ever the same again. And to be honest, not everything was a success. There were lots of mouldy things and non-starters and things like that. But for some reason, some I had enough successes um, than more successes than failures, and I carried on. Little did I know that I'd be writing my own similar kind of book for the similar kind of audience, which is a real joy, really. And it could be things like tomatoes and peppers and all kind, all kind of things that we'd otherwise throw away. I love a bit of upcycling. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's no harm in trying, is there? I just don't know how things are going to work. Uh, my son's had fun with uh, lemon pips and also uh, avocado, which is one of the ones I absolutely love um, trying because it's it's so kind of uh what's the word well it's just so it's a good size seed right for small hands and it's a quite a dramatic d 
development of that of that sprout that uh, you know it's a bit like you know uh, beans is the same kind of thing you get that really kind of you can really see what's happening it's not like a tiny seed where you can't see what's going on absolutely great fun and I suppose also there's also things like you know the do people still do what I used to do as a child you know the carrot top on the saucer of water watching that grow <laughs> I used to love that as a kid. And also the other one I used to like as a kid was the old cress, mustard and cress on a tissue. I mean, again, fantastic. And then you can eat it. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I'll put a link to that book, the Pip book, in the show notes for anyone who's interested in that. There's a few books like that from the 70s and 80s that are just absolute gold. And that's one I really absolutely love. Um, moving back to your book, though, let's talk about the illustrations because... I love the illustrations in this book. And I have to say, I'm quite fussy with illustrations. Having worked on my own book and with an illustrator, I kind of know what I like. But I love the illustrations in this book. They're so original. They're so engaging. Tell me about how that process worked and give us a sort of paint a picture as to what the illustrations uh, offer, please. So the both I Eat Sunshine for Breakfast and Jungle in Your Living Room are both illustrated by the same person who is called Philip Giordano. Um, and he is, um, he lives in Tokyo and he is, I believe he's Italian Filipino. And weirdly, I've I didn't have much connection with him or contact with him. It was all done via the conduit that were my editors for both books. And I mean, painting a picture is impossible to paint a picture of his images. I'm looking at it now. Um, I mean, just every single page of that book of these books are just like every image could just be cut out uh, if you dared and put in a picture frame because they're just beautiful. It's I'm not very good at describing the style, but it's a sort of not quite cartoony, but the thing about it is he these were his well, I Sunshine for Breakfast was his first um non-fiction book. And um he does lots of other other things all 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 over the world. It's scientific book, but he's got to try and these are you know, you can't get it wrong when you look when you're painting a drawing a, a monster relief, it's got to look like the right plant. And so he's kind of kept his own artistic style yet kept it pretty much scientifically accurate with with a few there like a ginkgo leaf in the first book wasn't bilobed but it actually you look at it and think actually that's still a ginkgo leaf so you, you, you know it just about works and they're just beautiful and they're fun there's always a little characters hamsters and cats and tortoises dotted through these book these pages which which are delightful they are delightful. I love those those animal characters that are included. I mean, there it's about a million miles away from botanical illustration is what I'd say. It's a very kind of graphic, very colourful um, illustration that we're talking about here. Very, you know, in a way, it's simple, and I say that as a compliment. But as you say, at the same time, I'm looking at the monster leaves on the cover. They have splits and holes in the way they should have. They've got aerial roots in the way they should have. Everything is kind of there. So that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about these pictures. And I do love the character. I guess it is a hamster. I was going to ask you, is that a hamster, the little the little round guy who is absolutely adorable? I mean, I, I don't know if, if, if Philip has any plans to, re, to release these as prints or to do them in other formats, but I just think they're... They're absolutely gorgeous. And I say that as somebody who's just sees so many illustrations of plants, but really, really fun. This week's show is supported by trueleafmarket.com, your source for seeds from vegetables and herbs to flowers and microgreens. True Leaf Market have been selling non-GMO gardening seeds and more since 1974. So whether you're starting out as a home gardener or you're a professional grower in need of a bulk order, True Leaf Market is here for you. Now, 
if you get confused looking at the huge range of vegetable varieties out there, just think of the lettuces. There's iceberg, there's oak leaf, there's romaine, there's cause. It's easy to feel overwhelmed about what's the right choice for you. And that's where True Leaf Market's brand new guided shopping quiz comes in. This is great because it will help you to choose the right varieties depending on where you're growing, your skill level and even your veggie preferences. And the quiz is available for all kinds of veg crops from watermelon to cabbage. And you can also check out True Leaf Market's free downloadable gardening guides for veg, herbs, microgreens and cover crops. There's free shipping on all orders over $75 and you can visit trueleafmarket.com and enter promo code OTL10 and get $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. Visit the show notes at janeperone.com for links to those quizzes, the downloadable guides and more. And enter code OTL10, that's OTL10, at trueleafmarket.com and you'll get $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. more from Michael Holland shortly but now it's time for a little bit of housekeeping which is quite frankly rather worrying as I look at the state of my office desk right now there's not been a lot of housekeeping going on in here recently anyone else a messy desk person (sighs) one day I'll get it tidy anyway thank you to Codified Madness and Rosie's Plants for leaving lovely, lovely, lovely five-star reviews for the show. Much appreciated. And to Leslie, who left a donation on coffee, Ko-Fi, whatever you like to call it. You can make a one-off donation to support the show, as Leslie did. Thank you so much, Leslie, and glad you enjoyed the Begonia Top 10. I'm still taking submissions, by the way, about what other top tens you'd like to see. Uh, Ficus and Tradescantia among the suggestions so far. And if you prefer to listen rather than read, do remember that Legends of the Leaf, my book on the fascinating backstories of 25 iconic houseplants, and also my first book, The Allotment Keeper's Handbook, are both available as audiobooks on Spotify and Audible. So if you have a subscription to either of those, you might not have to pay anything extra to get hold of them. You can become a super fan on my Patreon offering and get free access to both of those books, or you can buy them as one-offs on various audiobook platforms. So if you want a relaxing listen and uh, you want to learn more about either growing veg or the fascinating histories of houseplants, do go and check those out. I've been surprised by how many people are choosing to download and listen to the Allotment Keeper's Handbook. Uh, It's had a little, it's been a bit of a sleeper hit. So uh, do go and check that out. Feedback on the last episode 284, the Q&A on sustainable packaging. The question that came in about finding potting mixes bagged not in plastic, but in cardboard or paper. And Jeff got in touch with a really good point. Jeff worked for several years in a garden centre selling a lot of bag potting soil. And Jeff writes, I think another big reason why many companies still use plastic bags and stores mostly sell them is bugs. Fungus gnats and other pests can get into the tiniest tear or crack and lay eggs. So you really do want a well-sealed container. Unfortunately, paper and cardboard usually cannot be sealed nearly as well without some coating of plastic, similar to how paper coffee cups can't be recycled without extra processing. I'd also warn people that cockroaches love damp cardboard. Entomologists actually breed cockroaches on damp cardboard in labs when using them in research. So if people do want to buy cardboard packages of potting soil, I'd recommend transferring the soil from the box to a plastic tote or another type of well-sealed, reusable container rather than leaving the cardboard box around. Thanks for your thoughtful discussion of packaging and sustainability. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's a really valuable contribution. And indeed, I do put my potting mixes Uh, which actually on the whole do come in plastic bags into a plastic box 
I've actually got something that used to be a linen basket, a plastic linen basket, which is in my shed, which has got a lot of potting mixes in it. And then the rest of my various mixes of perlite and things are also in plastic boxes and thus they're sealed tight and fungus gnats can't get in there, which is very useful. Um, it's a good point about the cockroaches. I hadn't thought of that uh, or about the fungus gnat angle, but that's all a really good reason why these things aren't sold in paper and cardboard and something worth bearing in mind, as is often the case. I would say probably always the case. Things are complicated. Sustainability is not just a binary black and white issue. It's quite complicated. So we've always got to be looking for these nuances when we're talking about the best way forward. But hopefully that will help you to make better choices in future. On with question of the week now, and it comes from Elizabeth. And I apologise, Elizabeth, that your email got a bit neglected. Well, I say a bit neglected, a lot neglected. It was in the very bottom of my inbox and it's taken me too long to reply. Elizabeth, I did try to email you, but the uh, email bounced back. So I guess maybe you've <laughs> it's been so long you've changed email addresses. Sorry so sorry. I do usually try to respond to emails really quickly. So if I haven't responded to your question, please do give me a nudge. And this question actually arose as a result of a previous Q&A that I did. That was it in episode 258. And I'd answer the question about mealybugs and when to draw a line under them and say this plant needs to be composted because it has too many mealybugs. And I talked in that answer about taking cuttings and making sure that the cuttings were clean and Elizabeth's question was what exactly does that mean? Elizabeth writes I recently took cuttings from a prayer plant that was overrun by mealybugs it never occurred to me that the critters could survive being stuck in a jar of water while the cuttings took root and could possibly take over the resulting rooted plant. How does one clean cuttings or make sure they are clear of mealybugs? So that's a really good question because obviously taking cuttings of a plant is a really good backup method, but not if you're just transferring the pest onto a new plant. Can mealybugs survive underwater? Two aspects to the answer to this question. Aspect one, if you stick a cutting in a glass of water, the mealybugs won't instantly die and they will have time to move up the stem of the plant and find their way above the water level and then hide there so they won't necessarily be drowned. Even if the whole cutting was underwater, it would probably take at least 48 hours of total coverage by water for the mealybugs to die that is because they are covered in waxy secretions. The eggs, the babies and the adults have a waxy secretion or structure around them. Um, this helps them to resist pesticides and also helps them to avoid um, getting wetted because this waxy secretion is what we call hydrophobic, which means it repels water. So the water has to have long enough to be able to get through that layer and to the mealybug itself and kill it. So you can imagine they're pretty tough. The mealybug will either manage to crawl out of the water or it won't be in the water long enough that it will die. So yes, it's entirely possible that you could take a cutting, put it in water and you will not be free of mealybugs by the time that cutting has got to the stage of being ready to pot up. How then would you go about cleaning a cutting to get it ready for propagation? Here's a tough one. I have had cuttings of the smaller form of the forest cactus, Ripsalis paradoxa, the chain cactus. Somebody gave me some cuttings, which to be fair, they knew their plant had mealybugs and I took them anyway because I thought, oh yes, I can get rid of the mealies and... I had those cuttings for several months. I kept spraying them with soap spray, cleaning them, and and then I would think they were okay and come back a few weeks later and the mealybugs were back. So it's quite hard to do. As ever with pests, the war of attrition is what you're facing and it's something you've got to 
keep going with multiple, whatever you do, it's going to be done multiple times and keep the cutting away from your other plants. So mine were in a clear plastic bag so that the mealybugs couldn't escape and infest anything else. I think you need to go heavy duty on this, spraying on neat rubbing alcohol uh, and leaving it for as long as you dare and getting a soft toothbrush and actually using that to brush the cutting is easier if it's obviously something like uh, Ripsalis, which is quite tough, but use that toothbrush or a paintbrush to really get into all the nooks and crannies because that's where the mealybugs will be hiding. You could use horticultural soap spray. Again, the main thing is, is that you do it carefully and you keep going with it repeatedly. You know, you're risking killing the cuttings by putting neat alcohol on them, but better to have a dead cutting and no mealybugs than an alive cutting that has spread mealybugs to your whole collection. Remember also that mealybugs, some of their life stages, the, the instars of the mealybugs are too small to see with your naked eye. So you'll see the big adults, which are quite obvious, and the little nests that they make. These nests have a technical name, they're called ovisacs, and it's basically a load of eggs and they're all kind of bound together with this white waxy secretions again. So you can imagine, again, that's very hydrophobic. So you can see those with the naked eye, but you might not be able to see the younger mealybugs. So just go over every possible surface. Don't just apply your treatment just to the spots where you can see mealybugs. Go over the whole cutting with your treatment. Repeat, repeat, repeat. You can do this while the cutting is rooting. Um, You know, you can just wash off um, after you've done the treatment, whether it's alcohol or soap spray, then wash it off and just do it again every few days. And don't assume that you've got rid of the mealy bugs just because you can't see any. As I always say, a hand lens, that can be very useful to examine your cutting. And hopefully, you know, if you keep that up for a long time, your cutting by the time it's ready to be potted up will be mealybug free. So that's my suggestion on the mealybug front. It's a horrible thing to deal with and it's kind of soul destroying, not going to lie, that you've had a cutting and you've got to keep treating it, but I think it's the way to go. And in the case of Elizabeth, her prayer plant cutting You're going to have to be a little bit more careful than you would be with a succulent cutting, obviously, because the Maranta will be a bit more delicate. But again, I think it's worth going into all of those nooks and crannies on the plant. And with a prayer plant, I'd be particularly concerned with the petiole sheath. So the place where new leaves emerge on the leaf stalk, that is a very cosy place for a mealybug to hide. So I'd be paying particular attention to that part of the plant. Incidentally, while we're talking about Marantas, if I can just go off on a giant tangent for a moment, I was for some reason or other looking at the RHS website and their page for Maranta leucanura, the classic, what I would call the herringbone prayer plant. And I noted that the common name they give this plant is Ten Commandments. Now, some of these plant names, the common plant names that are on the RHS website, which is rhs.org.uk, if you want to check it out, uh, It's a brilliant site, loads of great resources, but I've never heard of this Maranta, Maranta leucanura, being called Ten Commandments. I've heard different explanations as to why this is. One, that it's because the leaves fold up at night as if in prayer, or because it's got ten dark green spots on the uh, the leaves. I mean, I'm looking at the leaves in the picture, and there's definitely more than ten dark green spots, but uh, there we go. If anyone can enlighten me, I'd love to know. Back to the Q&A question. And for more on mealybugs, do check out episode 143 of the podcast where I go into more depth about mealybugs, what they are and how to control them. Thank you for your question, Elizabeth. And I hope that wasn't too late to help you and maybe it's helped somebody else too. If you've got a question for On The Ledge, do drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. Now it's time to go back to my chat with Michael Holland. Let's go on to talking about some of the specific plants that you that you look at in the book and plants that maybe you find children in your experiences working at the Chelsea Physic Garden. What kind of plants are the ones that people that children tend to rush over to, get excited about, and come and ask you about? I mean, from 
from working in botanical gardens, both at Kew, as I mentioned, going around the Palm House, which is an amazing spectacle in its own right, but um, and also the, the mo- more modest but uh, glass houses at Chelsea Physic Garden and the wider garden. Because it's the Physic Garden, which links to physicians and medicine, it's got this heritage of medicinal plants for 350 years now. Um the very essence of what is a medicinal plant is that if it if it's a if it's an effective medicinal plant for a horrible disease, it's pretty much hundred percent likely to be deadly poisonous. Um, I mean, obviously, when you're going down to the marjoram and sage and um, culinary herb level, then they are of course edible, but they're still medicines. So poisons, you know, the fact that a plant can kill you. Ninety percent of plants on the planet Earth are poisonous, pretty much. So. That's the whole fact that plants contain poisons. That's that's a real factor of awe, I suppose, to, to kids, I've noticed. Cacti and other succulents, things that are spiky. And then carnivorous plants. I mean, so there's a theme there. Things that can kill you, things that can kill flies, and things can hurt you. <laughs> but also massive leaves. Big, you know, giant, just seeing a giant plant with a banana, banana plant with its gigantic leaves and the giant bamboo you do have it. Um, they do have at the Palm House at Kew that can grow in in nature, it, in its happiest happiest environment can grow a meter in a day. So that idea of something that you could pretty much watch grow um, if you had enough patience. That's to me that's awesome, and I think it is to them as well. I guess it depends on who your who your storyteller is, and that's back to what you were saying before about. If you, you could have a boring guide or you could have an excited, enthusiastic, <laughs> passionate guide taking you around a glass house. But yeah, no, those are the ones that really stood out. But also, as much as all of this, is, this was a really big turning point for me um, about 20 years ago, as well as all of those amazing things that school kids visiting Chelsea Physic Garden were just being wowed about, as well as, you know, seeing coffee growing on saying, oh, that's a that's vanilla. Oh, I didn't realize that came from a plant, all that sort of stuff. But then I remember one day there was a little boy and we're in a vegetable bed at Chelsea Physic Garden. He just saw the onion bed, the vegetable bed, and just saw the top of an onion growing. He saw the base of the onion, but with the leaves coming out of the ground. And he Im- immediately recognized that as something he'd seen at home. And he literally was jumping up and down, pointing at it, shouting, onion, onion, onion. And to me, that was like, oh yeah, of course it's an onion. But I did, I had that in my upbringing. My parents grew vegetables. Um, they were like Tom and Barbara from the Good, good Life, and um, but he didn't. And it got me thinking about that link or that lost link, that lost connection. And that I devised a project called Shelf Life, whereby I sort of semi tortured, but. I grew plants in corresponding packaging. So I'd have an orange juice carton with an orange tree in it or a pickled onion jar with an onion plant growing out of it, etc. And it kind of made a really good big impact um, to me and to, to, the, to the learning program there at the Physic Garden and to many others who've kind of tried it themselves around the world. So I think seeing things that are relevant, that's the a, a long answer to your question, I think is... Um, something that's relevant to their to their lives you know an onion that they might see in the in the fridge at home or in a, in, a, in on their dinner plate at home for sure um that idea that we use plants in our daily lives for sure absolutely absolutely and it's making those connections that really can make a difference i think to children and lots of children as you say don't know where an onion comes from or how apples get to the <laughs> the supermarket i mean it, it's I mean, I, I, I sometimes realise also where there are gaps in my own knowledge and that the other day I was thinking about, um, I can't think which spice it was, but I was literally thinking about a spice and thinking, I don't actually know what that is in terms of, is it a seed? Is it um, a flower? I don't, I don't know. And I was just thinking to myself, gosh, actually, you know, I consider myself to be fairly well-educated about these things, but there are plants involved in my life that I'm not really up to speed with where they're coming from. So it's an interesting one. Was uh, it a clove? And I can imagine there's a lot of joy. A clove, maybe? No, it wasn't clove. I did know that one. I think it might have been, oh, and it wasn't fenugreek. I'm trying to remember. It must have been Must have been to looking at some some sort of Southeast mm, Asian cuisine. Mm, um, nice. <laughs> um I mean, I'm always fascinated the fact that mace is made from the, I don't even know what the te- technical term for it is, the sort of a, the sheath that goes around the um, 
Is it almond? I'm trying to remember now. Uh, nutmeg. It, nutmeg. Yeah, yeah like that's the right. The calyx or the seed coat or something. Yeah. yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, and you think, gosh, those two things are linked, but they're not. They're they're so closely linked, but they're not the same. The same spice. Um, but I, I think that kind of thing's fascinating. I mean, maybe I'm probably boring onto my children about this stuff. All the seeds time, are fascinating. Sure they... Just, <laughs> yeah, you know, seeds are amazing. You've got everything from the biggest seed in the world, the coca de mer, that looks like a big gorilla's bottom or, and other things. And it's 22 kilos. And then you've got tropical orchid seeds um, can be a thousandth of a gram and just float around in the, in the, in the jungles and waiting on, well, hoping for the best that they'll find the right fungus to team up with that will give them the nutrients to grow on the, on the bark of a tree. It's, it, it's amazing. Seeds are a really great place to start. And I, th- I guess that ties back into what you were saying about, you know, the pit book and, you know, taking a seed and figuring out how to grow it, what it needs um, to actually germinate is a, is a fascinating business. And I know there's, you know, botanists who that's their life's work, which, <laughs> which strikes me as a fascinating I, job. I spent a f- um, the day on last Friday at the at Waker's Place, a sister, sister garden of Kew Gardens. And um, my friend's the current director there, Ed Eichen, and, he took me into the kind of the, the vaults of the Millennium Seed Bank. I'd never been in there before, and it was just I, I just I was like a little kid in the sweet shop, you know, looking at packets of seeds that have been brought back from Saint Helena and Pakistan and Lebanon and Svalbard, and it was like wow, and it was brilliant. It was really good. I didn't go into the deep freeze, but it was fascinating. Found it really good. Going back to what we were talking about with plants that children are drawn to. I just wanted to ask you about Venus flytraps. Um, I'm sure they're in the book. I haven't, I'm sure that they're in here somewhere. I haven't actually seen that. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I think there's a carnivorous plant bog or a kind of a bottle terrarium, a, a, a carnivorous terrarium in there of some sort. Yeah, they're in the, they're in there. They're in both books, actually. They're a great passion of mine. They've come into the public eye once again through the John Lewis Christmas yes. ad featuring a sort of fantastical Venus flytrap, let us say. Well, I mean, I've, I've kind of shared my thoughts about this on social media, but what do you think of this? Do you think it's a I mean, I'm not going to break it down in a binary. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Because obviously it's more complicated than that. But do you feel it's a positive addition or something that's going to draw children into thinking about carnivorous plants, perhaps? I did receive a message from a friend a couple of days ago saying, have you seen the John Lewis ad? I saw it and I thought of you, Michael. And I have now gone and looked at it. Um, I really like it. It's, yeah, it's kind of fantastical. I think that if children then go out and buy a Venus flytrap, they might be a little disappointed. They're not as animated as that, you know. Um, <laughs> it's amazing by the end of that advert that they, that family still has has that small dog. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. I was. It looks like it's got a good appetite on it and big enough to eat a small dog. Um, I mean, there are carnivorous plants in the world that have been found with shrews, with small, uh, even baby monkeys apparently drowned in them. Um, but that's not the active types, the, the passive ones that are just, you know, pools of water, liquid. Um, no, I think it's great. Any Anything that brings plants to life, and that certainly does, it can can only be a good thing, really. And it's quite an interesting message as well kind of like go for something that's a little bit out of the ordinary from your your standard boring Christmas tree. But, yeah. you know, but the very, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. And actually, I agree. I mean, yeah. I think, it's, sorry, go ahead. Well, the actual fact that we bring a tree into our houses um, for a month or maybe more uh, is a weird thing. You know, I often say, what if aliens came to planet earth around this kind of time of year and looked in our windows, they're like, hang on a minute, they're cutting them out, cutting them down out there. And then putting them in their houses and decorating them. What is this species? You know, but actually, it's a nice thing. We do, whether it's Easter birch tree in, in Scandinavia dressed up with Easter eggs or various plants used in Hindu ceremonies and other cultural ceremonies or, or a Christmas tree. You know, I quite like that, that we've got this. That's kind of a almost not quite lost connection, but a connection with, with the plant world that we use. And it symbolizes something, it symbolizes that spring will come again i think there's been a lot of issues with um talking to plant sellers in this country actually getting hold of fly traps now that we've left the uh, eu and the cites regulations are affecting imports of plants like venus fly traps and also cacti and succulents so i'm not sure how good the supply is i do quite like the john lewis plushy um venus fly trap though 
<laughs> which is probably the one that's like a more reliable purchase if you actually, uh, you know, that will not die on you as the Venus flytrap may well do. <laughs> I actually just remembered that in that advert, he's he grows it from an acorn, which is really weird. It looks like he plants an acorn and he gets a Venus. But that's that's also a bit a bit misleading, to be honest. Yeah, that that was a. I looked at that and I was looking sort of looking at starts going, oh my gosh, look at that! They've basically <laughs> taken an acorn without its cap on it. But I guess you know, again, this is illustrating the fact that uh, artistic license is being taken, and of and of course, you know, as I always like to reflect, you know, this is part of a long history of this plant being mythologized that goes way back to when it was very first, um, you know, brought to the UK from North and South Carolina in 1768 or whatever it was. Um, so it's it's very part of a very long tradition, which I found fascinating. But um, I think probably if, if in terms of carnivorous plants as a starter plant, I think I'd be directing somebody towards something like Drosera capensis, the sundew, maybe. Would you agree as a starter, something a little bit easier than the Venus flytrap? I'd say, yes, yeah, sundew or some of the Saracenias. I mean, I've got one in the kitchen, which is a Nepenthes. That's a bit not too tricky at all. It's a Nepenthes alata. Some people call it monkey cups. And that just hangs down um, in a hanging basket. And I think they're all quite easy to grow. As long as you just follow a few simple instructions, um, they, they love rainwater. Pretty much all of them need quite a lot of sunlight. And, um, yeah, don't be alarmed. Like you said, the Venus flytraps do die back in the winter. So do some of the Saracenias, the pitcher plants. So don't be alarmed if they look a bit dead now-ish for a few months because that's what they do. It's just the dormancy. And I I buy mine from Hampshire carnivorous plants, and they are brilliant, you know, because they they grow them all. They're all, like, sustainably done and always award-winning in their ch- in their RHS flower show displays as well. But um, he was telling, Matthew was telling me that quite a lot of these Saracenias can, they actually are from North America, as you said, and some of them are from Canada, and they go down to minus 10 centigrade um, in the winter, and they almost need that to give them the vigor for the following year. So there can be outdoor plants in the UK um, and other parts of Europe. So that's a good, they're, they're pretty tough, and they're, they're pretty amazing, those those pictures. I think they're. I think they're all right. I think they're all quite straightforward to grow. Now, I wanted to finish up by just asking you what you want to do next. What are your next plans? Are you obviously you're probably like like most authors, just kind of basking <laughs> and getting the publicity done for this book. But do you have more plans for taking this further with um, books or any more projects that you've got in mind for? Um, this particular aspect, which is ever more important as we sort of face a future of climate change. I do want to write more books. Um, I've already sent Flying Eye Books a few ideas that I've got, not necessarily all about plants, but sort of roughly about the natural world. And um, we'll see what happens. And I have actually got, a, a, as a with a different publisher, a, a beginner's gardening book aimed at like five-year-olds um, coming out in the spring. Oh, nice. It hasn't got a name yet, but um, that's that's been written. Um, and you mentioned raccoons. I've got a book that uh, came out in June uh, with a German publisher all called Smart Animals, and that features raccoons. <laughs> They're clever little things, very clever, cleverer than us, I think, most of the time. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing more books from you, Michael. I was absolutely enchanted by this one. Um, But thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks so much for having me. Do check out the show notes at janeperone.com, where, as ever, you'll find a full transcript of this episode, along with access to all the other episodes of this show, of which there are many. 280 odd so plenty of material there to go back and listen to and there's a handy thematic guide on my website too so if you're looking for episodes about a specific topic do check that out Uh, it's linked off the podcast page so just go to janeperone.com click on the podcast page and you'll see there in bold the thematically arranged list of episodes do hope you have a fantastic couple of weeks and I will speak to you soon. Remember, take care of yourself, then take care of your plants because you deserve it. Bye.
The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku, and Overthrown by Josh Woodward. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.